Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast. And today, my guest is Kelsey Card, who is on Instagram as at Rosie Heels. If you want to go and follow her there and find out some more about her, and I'm sure that a lot of you do follow her there. She's got a, a big and growing following, and um, sharing about her healing journey using a uh, raw vegan foods and um, maybe other things that we'll, we'll learn about and hear more about and shares a lot of inspiring stuff about her own journey to better health. So Rosie, thank you for joining us today. And is there anything else you would, sorry, Kelsey, sorry, but <laughs> I'm getting confused already. Is there anything else you want to say and or would you like to introduce yourself a little bit or say anything more about yourself sure sure yeah thank you for having me on um i love the podcast i think it's a jewel of the community so i appreciate it a lot um yeah i yeah um i could i could start by clearing up the rosie kelsey name thing (laughs) if you want um so i started i you know, I started my Instagram account in 2015 or 16 um, in response to coming down with chronic illness issues and kind of first beginning to navigate healing around that. Um, The issues that I had were mast cell activation syndrome or histamine intolerance. And I had dysautonomia um, issues, which I think were definitely linked to POTS, but I was never diagnosed with anything um, like that. I I always wanted testing for it, but didn't stick around long enough to get that. Um, Sorry, you you had all these different things. Are these common to have together or are they? um... They actually really are common to have together. Um, And sorry, if I'm breaking up, Ronnie, let me know. know You you paused slightly there, but we'll keep going and Hopefully it gets, it's okay. Okay. Um, Yeah, there's actually, it's kind of known as a trifecta oftentimes, this MCAS, POTS, and EDS cluster. Um, People think it's kind of a genetic cluster, and it's really interesting because I've seen it kind of show up in my family members in different ways, unbeknownst to them. But now that I'm aware of these issues and and I can see the way they operate in genes, Yes, but I really expressed more and quite suddenly the histamine issues at one point. Um, But actually it all started with like a near syncope, almost passing out episode in my office one day. And um, that happened twice very significantly before I moved into this territory of like that episode kind of recurring every day kind of on a, a scale. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of the pot stuff I think that I had. Um, and EDS is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a hypermobility connective tissue issue. Um, and a lot of people who have that will present with like subluxing joints that pop out a lot and um, some other connective issues. And I really think that potentially expressed for me in the gut Um, everything really started for me with gut issues and I can look back and see that that started as early as high school and you know my really young young life were these conditions are these seen as genetic conditions that there's not really any answer to is that how they're they're yeah yeah they definitely are Um, and mast cell activation syndrome is pretty new I mean MCAS, POTS, and EDS are all very new diseases. And um, honestly, most people who are presenting with these issues will go to their doctor and be much more expert level on the topic. Many doctors haven't even heard of these issues. So there's you know specialists that you can try to dig down to at one point. But um, yeah, I think that's what makes um, healing and talking about healing these particular issues really difficult is because people look at them as genetic issues and and it's even more reason to um drill down into like i i can't heal this um you know this is something that happened to me and that's coupled with the fact that people with histamine intolerance often get down to a number of safe foods that often include meat 
um, just because it's not triggering an acute reactive response in the body. And, you know, I think it's much like the carnivore stuff right. in, in that it's, you know, it's fiberless and it's, it's like a Band-Aid type situation. Um, you don't realize that you're creating a whole mess with that. But anyway, not to, you know, dig into that too much right now, but. Um, Did you try that? Did you try the uh, low carb approach? Well, definitely the low carb approach. Um, so yeah, when I was first sick and I, I think I really like had kind of a health mindset for a long time, like since my teens, I think that was birthed from, um, you know, an inappropriate notion to try to control my body and my body image and those types of things, which I think a lot of young women start out like trying to be healthy for that reason, obviously. Okay. Um, so that was me for sure. Um, and so I was always eating salads and trying to eat healthy. I think intuitively I, I did know that it made me feel better too. Um, so yeah, during the time I got sick, I was kind of into paleo, low carb, really low carb for most of my life. Um, most of my like teen to adult, right. young adult life. I spent a year being vegetarian at one point. My partner and I watched Food Inc. and made like a half connection <laughs> and it was really strong, but then we just didn't keep, keep the light on, I guess, you know, uh, it's pretty interesting actually, but yeah, so very low carb paleo style. And when I was first sick, I was getting gut test healing, um, gut test. Yeah healing mechanisms going on with different naturopathic doctors. And so they had me cut out things that I was, you know, allergic to, um, given those different tests. And so I removed dairy and, um, eggs because those were the things that were highly allergenic to me. So it was kind of a, a good starting point, but I definitely would be like really heavy vegetable and grass fed meat and mm -hmm. salmon and things like that yeah so and, i very much moved away from that over time right right and and like uh how bad did it get the situation you had with the pots and cas eds what what can you kind of give a picture as to what that looks like feels like how it affected your life etc mm -hmm. yeah uh boy well it came on in what felt like very suddenly but um, after these first couple episodes, and it was entangled in what was being diagnosed as um, uh, chronic sinus infections. So like I was having a lot of inflammation and I went through several rounds of antibiotics and steroids right before all this happened. I was also taking Sudafed for like months every day. Um, yeah. so I, I think it's no coincidence that there was a tipping point after that, but yeah, so in the thick of it, it was really, I felt like I was gonna pass out almost every day. Um, there was gray in my peripheral all the time. I felt very, very fatigued. And so all of these things kind of on a scale, I had pretty bad reactions to food and it felt like everything I ate and everything I did would trigger this long or short flare. Um, it, it definitely felt like being kind of in a constant flare, whether or not you're in right. the, the bad point or the coming out point. Um, Did yeah, you so I was... Sorry. No, go ahead. It said, well, I was just going to say, did you make the connection that food was playing a role in this, at, like straight away, mm -hmm. or did it take you some time to make that connection? Pretty quickly, I noticed that. Um, particularly alcohol was something that I just had to cut out immediately. It was making me so, so sick and even just small amounts of alcohol. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I actually was eating avocado and eggs for breakfast every morning and, um, but I had cut out dairy. And so I thought, you know, I was kind of feeling better at first. It was really ironic that um, my testing was like, these are highly inflammatory. And obviously it's like the worst thing I could possibly <laughs> be doing um, right. or close to it. So yeah, I felt like 
modes of relief and chapters of relief when I took out different things. Um, but I still felt like I was enthralled in the flares all the time and still very much um, feeling very uneasy, like not at all like myself. The main things I just couldn't see right. I just felt like I was um, a totally different person. I felt really kind of disassociated a lot of the time, depersonalized a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just have to lay down in a store and like put my feet up on the wall, things like that. I did yeah. that every day, all day, um, just to mitigate feeling like I was gonna pass out a lot. And then these, these reactions to food. So I get rashes and really swollen. Uh, the chronic fatigue was very bad. Um, waking up and not being able to get out of bed for a long time, working in bed a lot and just, yeah, everything, everything changed in terms of how I was interacting with the world. Yeah. I think I saw in some of your in some of your posts, like up to that point, you were quite focused on your career and things like that, and you were mm -hmm. working a lot. Uh, yeah. is, was was that was that what your life was like as well? Yeah, um, I was definitely focused on career, and I was really into media and TV production in college, and I I worked in news for a while, and that was so stressful. And I also worked in dog rescue um, in the years around that. And that was also very stressful, um, amazing work, but just so emotionally draining. <laughs> and also wrapped, on, wrapped into like toxic productivity with my jobs was also the fact that I, I could never set boundaries for myself. I was a super people pleaser and this just like rotted away at me, I think. I think in a lot of ways, um, it drove me into chronic illness as being a disruptor mm -hmm. to kind of wake up and, um, you know, advocate for myself and find out who I really was. Right. Yeah, it was yeah. a good wake up call. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of people will say that, you know, that mm -hmm. chronic illness um, sure. kind of diverted them to become the, the people they were meant to be. <laughs> What kind of emotion, like emotionally, was it quite a lot of fear going through that? Was it panic, distress? Like what, mm -hmm. what kind of did you actually go through with all that? Yeah, so much fear. Um, just an immediate distrust of yourself and the body too. And that, that was at least my experience. Um, very disempowering. I remember the first time I kind of had one of these episodes, I was embarrassed immediately, like, you know, to reach out and ask someone for help. And so I think there's a lot of self-shame and mm. self-hatred of thinking that your body's turning on you. And then the right. fear is, the fear is really intense. Um, but I, I got over the fear, I think, just residually over time, because I always thought I was going to pass out in public or something really bad was going to happen. Sometimes I thought I would die in my sleep. No joke. I just like had right. that level of fear that something was really wrong. Yeah. And um, when you don't die and you just like learn to live with those weird things, then um, it becomes more manageable. But I did think I always kind of knew that I had the capacity to dig out of it. Like that's my sights were always set on that. Um, yeah, it's something I was talking to my brother's wife yesterday, uh, both of them actually, um, and they're both doctors and she was they were talking i was asking them about people that have like rare conditions and things and and how do they deal with uh you know certain conditions and and she was saying that she was talking about a particular patient that had never got over this sense of anger of like why did this happen to me you know mm -hmm. why why me and that yeah. potentially this like you're talking about the fear and and I, I wonder if some people like they never get through that or over that and it makes them stuck like they never you know learn to deal with it I wonder did was that something they had to go through as well yeah huge um you definitely nailed it I think <clears throat> that's a really tricky thing because I talk a lot about um the mindset and getting out of that victim mindset. And it, 
it's a fine line between saying that your symptoms aren't real. Like, obviously, um, you have to acknowledge that like what's happening is real to your body and do yourself due diligence and respecting that reality. But you have to be able to move on from it and be willing to move on from it. And I do think um, I was really stuck for a long time in that mindset and um, very, very sad about it and very woe is me. Mm. And, you know, I, I know a lot of other people with chronic pain or chronic illness who, who slip into that. And honestly, um, it's probably something I can identify that may have been a part of my life even before that. Um, it's, it could have been something that manifested greatly. Um, I think it also manifests because of trauma and food environment, like everything, you know, but I do think, um, the pain body is what Eckhart Tolle talks about this kind of, um, mm -hmm. this thing on your back that just feeds off the negative energy. And Joe Dispenza sort of talks about that too that we're kind of addicted to that in some ways and in different ways. So yes, I think there's a huge uh, breaking down process around the mind and letting go of disease labels. And that's really hard to do when you're seeking validation for something you're not getting validation for in conventional medicine or with your social groups, you know, you feel really, really lost. And so it's almost like you're forced to dig into um, that label because it gives you identity and empowerment and gives you an explanation mm -hmm. for how to navigate things. So yeah. yes, super tricky. Before we go forward into like your story of what actually happened with your healing journey and changing your diet and trying different things out and all that, um, how would you, I'm guessing you were brought up there for a pretty conventional diet and lifestyle. And where, and actually, where do you come from? Are, are you live? Do you live in the same place you grew up, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I do. Um, I grew up in Oregon, in the states, and I've lived three different places in Oregon, like since college. So I haven't really lived anywhere else, and I've actually traveled like quite little in my life. So it's it's an area I'm excited to explore, but. Um, yeah, I lived a really standard American childhood. I grew up eating standard American foods. Um, I think in the beginning of my life, there was a little bit more home cooked food. But later on, like as my parents got divorced and things became, you know, more convenient and there was trauma and just, you know, life happens. And I ate fast food probably almost every day, I think for a decade, probably like, um, in middle school and high school. Um, so yeah, and I, I always noticed irritation. Um, like I had digestive issues in high school and I know it was connected to the food obviously, but I never really made that connection. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and I, you know, I was an active kid and did sports and just really lived the uh, quintessential <laughs> standard American childhood. But um, yeah, I think, you know, there was some early trauma, later trauma, life trauma, like everyone deals with this on some level and um, that kind of stuff. And just our social conditionings in general from when we're young and all that stuff really shapes us and I think has a huge role in chronic illness and ultimately finding this lifestyle and healing, healing your child like self and finding that inner peace you know yeah yeah for sure um yeah so let's get back to fast forward to this moment i guess where you've been diagnosed with these conditions and was your did you try other things before you approached making a radical change to your diet or was it quite quick for you or talk about maybe tell us about that a little bit yeah I did try lots of things. <laughs> I was like desperate trying lots of things. Um, I kind of fought from the beginning and <clears throat> knew there was kind of natural ways out of this from the beginning. Um, so when I was first 
seeing naturopaths and getting testing done, there was a lot of inflammation in the gut and no good gut bacteria on the test at all, period. Oh, wow. So they really approached it from um, that standpoint at first. So I went through a lot of gut healing things like, yeah. um, you know, I gosh, I can't even remember some of this stuff now which I think is a good thing, but Very, um, various products or medicines, products. Or... Yeah. Products and supplements. So like GI healing formulas, right. yeah, um, yeah. there's one really common, uh, glutamine L glutamine. Right. I took yeah. that for like a year. It's actually a really controversial, uh, supplement. Uh, someone's out there really, um, saying that it causes cancer, which is interesting. Um, but I, I think, you know, ultimately supplementation to that degree is detrimental, but I did a lot of that. Um, were you, do, sorry, I, were, you, were you doing that? I mean, what was, so what was doctor's advice? Cause I, I imagine you might've went to medical doctors first. So did you, was the supplement something you found on your own or did, were you recommended that through like doctors was, or? Yeah. Well, actually I saw naturopaths from the beginning. All right. Okay. <laughs> So I was already really kind of into the natural health right, I see, I see. world a bit. Yeah. 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 And um, so they were prescribing these things. And, you know, I took a lot of supplements for the histamine. We worked on low histamine diet and low histamine foods. And of course, that's kind of relieving in the beginning. But I think it's a, a bad road to go down um, in terms of fruits and vegetables, um, limiting those foods. I think you want periods where you're abstaining if you have to, but you have to kind of keep these things in rotation um, so they don't become more and more intolerant, I think. Um, so a lot of stuff with the diet, which, which was nice that I wasn't working in conventional uh, medicine mode. And I really never wanted to from the beginning, but the naturopaths uh, sent me to many different specialists. So I saw an eye specialist and I saw a rheumatologist and she thought I may have had um, some like autoimmune lupus type markers. And she's actually the one who recognized my hyper mobility and the connection right. to the gut. Um, so lots of different specialists and um, ultimately like that stuff helped little by little by little, but mostly I think because I was cutting out more and more animal products. So between 2015 and 18, I, I'm sort of on this progressive path towards plant-based eating. Um, and by the end of that, I was really just eating salmon sometimes. I had found fruit and that was through medical medium. Um, I honestly don't remember the moment, but it was obviously from Instagram and uh, seeing stuff on there. And I read his first book, uh, The Mysteries of Chronic Illness and How to Heal or something like that. And um, it's a really beautiful book that that first one and i know he's pretty controversial and um i was never a, like a devout <laughs> follower or anything but it resonated so deep because he talked about epstein-barr virus and that's one thing i haven't mentioned but i had that uh chronic reactivated epstein-barr was something that came up in testing also uh chronic cmv cytomegalovirus or something so i had high viral activity in the body and um yeah, his book made a lot of sense, but fruit, the fruit fear chapter is what really mm. changed my brain. So I, I have yeah. him to credit for that. So um, once that happened, I started bringing in more and more fruit and I just was kind of slowly moving away from any kind of animal products. Um, and then at some point I found John Stearns, the mango Terrian and Robert Morris, um, by really weird scenario, my, my partner and I were in an argument about whether or not your pee should be clear um, in terms of hydration. And he looked that up and found John Stearns. And so it was really serendipitous that I was looking for answers for healing. And we found this random guy who was doing all this stuff with fruit and healing crazy you know, fatigue and um, other mm -hmm. issues. So that's how it all unfolded. And the ethical message really made its way to me at, at about the same time. Yeah, I only, uh, I heard about that guy because I was, um, 
I went through a period of time of eating mangoes myself and I remember that and so <laughs> and so a few people had mentioned to me that guy who had done it for like six months or more or something mm -hmm. but I never um I never met him or anything I, I don't know if I was I think I was in Thailand I don't know if he was in the same place but um oh wow but yeah so uh did you start to feel a difference straight away eating more fruit and things like that what, what was yeah what was, what was that like yeah that was magical it was a magical oh, wow. time yeah i mean and that's what locked it in so fast for me i think i had just been you know waiting for something like this i'd been searching for something like this for three years really diligently and so yeah it just when i first read that medical medium chapter i was kind of hesitant because i was very programmed on low carb um so it was hard at first, but I knew that it made me feel good when I was when I was doing that, and so I became uh, pretty subscribed to it. And then, yeah, when I I just kind of jumped into all fruit after we binge watched uh, John's videos, and I just felt so much clarity and relative energy to what I was experiencing with fatigue. Um, and I could tell that my symptoms were just kind of lifting. And I always remember telling my partner that, you know, I'll know when I've really dug deep, when I can kind of see normally again. And it was always hard to explain what that meant to other people, mm -hmm. but um, that started to happen like two or three months in and I, I could feel it happening more and more. And I wasn't getting these breakouts anymore. And I just felt so spiritually elated and connected. And I just knew that that was it, you know? Amazing. So, Give me one moment. I'm going to turn the light yeah. on. Sure. How late is it there? Half past 10. Oh, you're staying up late now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I Obviously, people are all over the world. So interviewing people whenever is convenient for them, I suppose. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, did was that challenging for you to make that shift, to make that change? Or like, were you pretty happy to just jump straight into it? I was really happy to jump into it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the challenges have come sort of later when I've experienced the healing and I feel so much better. And I'm like, I feel like if I put a number on it, it's like 85 to 90% healed. I'm very much a realist about knowing that right. I have more work to do, but um, so that, that's more of a challenge like in the last year and a half for me is kind of loosening up the reins a little bit. But in the beginning, I was so thirsty for something like that. And it just felt so good that it wasn't hard. I don't remember it being very hard um, because I was so in love with it, you know? Um, yeah, so I definitely, I think, you know, made some potential mistakes in the beginning. And it's funny to look back on like how you progress and learn about mm -hmm. fruit and, you know, the optimal diet, but I was just doing like organic cold pressed apple juice with wild blueberries and berry smoothies and bananas and watermelon and lots of juicing and just bootstrapping it with, um, you know, no, no kind of like exotic tropical sure, sure. food or anything. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people overestimate that kind of stuff. Like, you don't really need to have exotic fruits or whatever to to make it work. Yeah. Uh, but um, tight. I'm trying to interested in the timeline here. So, from starting to eat more fruit, when, like, when did you start to get results? Do you think, and at what point would you say that you were really starting to see progress? Like, just in terms of I, I don't know if people appreciate maybe how long it takes. And you said, you say now you're still, you know, you're still in the middle of that to some degree. Um, yeah. But what, 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 what kind of timeline do you think people should expect that might be in your situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I always say I dove into fruit, but really I had this three year transition period <laughs> to getting into that. And I think that's right. why I was so elated. I really didn't have like, 
too much detox. The detox really settled in that winter, like six months in when things just kind of finally hit and emotionally too, I went through a lot of emotional detoxification and lots of crying and dealing with old things literally coming out of my body. It's, it's really a crazy process um, on that front. But yeah, I think that it's, it's usually not super fast, but I had gotten to this point where I really moved animal products out of the body completely, I think, before I jumped into that. So it was, it was ready for the taking, but I think right. for most people, you have to take way more time and transition appropriately and really get like the education down, you know, like if you're not excited about learning about this and you don't feel pulled in and you're not binge watching, you know, YouTube videos and reading lots of books, then there might be something missing and you, you might not be quite ready. Um, and just, I think trying to get to a plant-based diet is the most important thing first. Um, and that, yeah, it obviously takes people years to master this and get it down. And I think healing is not at all overnight, but I did experience rapid healing um, in the first three months on fruit. And I did really like probably 95% fruit for the first three months that I, that I found out about this. And then I kind of um, leveled out a bit more with, with greens and stuff. So I think my story is kind of unique in that way, but it, it has the context of the fact that I had kind of worked up to that. And I did go hard, um, but yeah, I. You were kind of vegetarian at first, like just fruits for a while. Yeah, you were yeah, yeah. Like I would do these those berry smoothies and eat fruit, and then I would have dried figs and dates and stuff like that. Um, so I, I would have avocado and tomato and some lettuce meals, um, but it wasn't as often. Like I was making quite a point to to do fruit high fruit and at that um, point we, we, we used had you were you back at work like we used had you always worked at that point or like yeah just... I had actually always worked um right. it really worked out nicely for me when I first got sick I was laid off and I was on an unemployment for a while and then I found a job working with an old friend who does great ape photography documentary and stuff and I was like doing video editing for him out of his home part-time so yeah it was amazing <laughs> it's so cool to look back on that too and like I was fascinated by watching apes eat fruit he has oh, all this yeah. amazing footage yeah of them <laughs> eating fruit and never once did I make the connection and he hasn't either <laughs> which I find fascinating well, I've, I've, I interviewed like um uh primatologist who's been yeah. studying these animals for 40 years and they've not made yeah. that connection it's so it's so funny talking to them because i remember saying well see the fruits that they eat could we could we eat them and she's like no 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 we could never eat them and i was like okay and then later on i was like so what fruits do they eat and she goes oh they eat these really delicious figs i'm like what like she's got a total <laughs> disconnection like saying two totally different things yeah. like what i don't i don't understand this you know yeah um, but it's funny because uh because then i was saying well you know when we were evolving were we eating fruit and she was like well we were we were doing a whole bunch of things we were eating stuff in the forest and all that. i'm like but what <laughs> it's just there's this there's a weird disconnect there even with people yeah, yeah that that study these animals mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I love watching that footage me too i do yeah. think, let, me, let me ask you a question about that specifically so with that kind of documentary, are they looking for the kind of the action footage of the hunting and the, like, I'd love to see the fruit eating, but I think most people want to see like the fighting and the hunting and all this. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. You know, I, he actually, it's really centered around saving great apes. So it's really centered right. around sanctuary work. Yeah. So he would go to lots of different sanctuaries and, you know, spend time and the Congo um, and Rwanda with the gorillas. Um, so yeah, he featured gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, and prime uh, chimps. Amazing. 
connect and just yeah i'd love, I'd love to like do, a, I'd love to do like a, a tour or a, a retreat to these places like i don't yes. know if these charities would be up for that but like we bring 20 people and everyone will pay towards the charity or whatever I think that's a really cool. great idea i love that <laughs> yeah. what a connection for the fruitarians to make <laughs> yeah yeah I, I but yeah i love it's but it is quite hard to actually find footage and pictures of apes eating fruit it's almost like it's just not interesting so mm -hmm. they, just, they just kind of cast it aside it's so it's so funny yeah yeah he had great footage of baby orangutans eating mangoes and it's the best it's the oh best. wow yeah there was a great there was a great piece of footage recently it was a it was a monkey eating a banana right so and it it very carefully peeled the banana and then it very carefully you know little strings it took every yeah. one of the strings off one at a time yeah and it was it was and people were watching it and you know people in the comments were like wow they it's exactly like i do and you're like yeah of course it's it's the exact same instinct that comes from <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. the same evolutionary lineage like mm -hmm. this isn't stuff that we decided to peel a banana that way like that's how we were evolved to do it you know yeah yeah it's it's amazing yeah yeah but uh, so getting back to the your, your story here so it sounds a little bit like plain sailing like once you found the fruit got on it was it pretty much just that was you and it just all worked out or any other stumbling blocks along the way? And did you find you had to change anything else or um, try anything else out to help with it or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that was really a honeymoon stage in, in a really good way. Um, and then I moved um, to Bend, which is more central Oregon and colder winters. Um, and I just kind of settled into the, the reality um, of, you know, fumbling around with making this long term and, and making it best practice and optimal. So, you know, I think I had I've had moments with higher fat. Um, I didn't read 801010 actually until this last year, which is amazing. But, you know, I discovered the principles of low fat long right. before that. But I think everyone probably goes through that that period where they're um, learning on their own bodily terms that uh, higher fat or even just mid mid fat sometimes can be uh, a lot on the body, especially I think from a place of healing it was just really apparent. So yeah, I've had to make so many different relative tweaks over the last three years and I still am, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm still very fluid and flexible. And I'm still kind of trying different things at different times. I think with the way the seasons work and, you know, whatever's going on for you locally, it's just kind of fun to, to do that. And um, yeah, particularly with healing and knowing that I still have things to heal. And, you know, I do have relative flares. It's just, my life is not at all dominated by that anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different life to live but um yeah I, I have my dips and i have to navigate what may have triggered that without trying to get too attached um the one thing i'll say i think is the number one silent like just wrecker is stress subconscious mm. stress mm. it's huge and i um i work a remote job it's it's pretty great um, in that way that it's, you know, I, I have the luxury of working from home, but I still have relative stresses with the matrix world. And um, when that stuff is underlying, then things kind of go awry and it goes so far beyond diet, you know? Um, so sleep is really, really crucial too, and just managing stress. Um, and I can tell that, you know, foods that would never have triggered me um, at a certain period of time can potentially trigger me at different times when there's stress or, you know, hormone stuff going on. So I, I think I think about stress as well as the people that are in denial about being in stress and mm -hmm. maybe don't even I think people think the stress means I feel so stressed, but it might not necessarily be as obvious to them as that. 
Do you think yeah. that's good? Oh yeah, yeah. And there's like there's some sort of societal defeat in admitting stress, or maybe in this community in particular, like we're we're all, you know, awake and uh, buzzing with higher consciousness, and like no no one wants to admit maybe that <laughs> stress might still affect them. But the subconscious stress, like the silent stress, I um, yeah. I had an incident happen that I didn't think was really bugging me. Um, and I went out on a walk and got like a little patch of hives and I've never had hives, even, even through mast cell activation syndrome, it just wasn't one of my symptoms. Um, so it just was like, wow, you know, the body is crazy. Yeah. I often think that like this, I get this thing sometimes where I wake up super early out of the blue. <laughs> like oh yeah four in the morning or something like really mm -hmm. early and I'm just awake and I I and that's kind of a thing for me of going there's something going on here like this whether I consciously know something like I almost feel it's like there's there's a relationship between your conscious self and your subconscious and you have to like it's quite hard to actually uh uh understand what's going on there sometimes and uh yeah. I, I think that was a little these these kind of moments for me things happening that are outside of your normal uh thing and that particular for yeah. me that that like all of a sudden getting up in the morning really early uh out of the blue and and it just makes me go there's something going on here that I'm not dealing with that I'm not mm -hmm. like so some part of me is not happy and it's just trying to tell me. You know? yeah. yeah, I've had that too. I mean, I actually have it happen a lot, especially around the full moon, not, not a lot, but like for a while there, it was kind of once a month type thing. And many times when it happens, I'll get up and just write, like there's something that just needed to come out. And it's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I have this, I have this thing that, I think that um, it's hard to explain, but I feel like there's there's uh, the conscious part of your mind and all that, all the conscious stuff, you know, and there's this whole other part of you that, and I, what my belief is, there's the two sides of the brain, there's different ways of looking at this, but there's part of you that that communicates with you consciously and through language and words. There's another part of you that can't communicate with you through language and words because it doesn't have, like if it is the left hand or the right hand side of the brain, it doesn't have the language and system there to do that. So mm -hmm. it tries to communicate with you through essentially feeling maybe emotions, sound, mm -hmm. pictures, images, like, all this other stuff you know what I mean and I think that's part of what what the fascination with art is about as well and all that kind of stuff but you mm -hmm. know people say you met this person and I had a bad feeling about them consciously you didn't know anything bad about them you didn't hear anything bad about them and all that but there is a part of you that's taking in maybe potentially more information yes. has more awareness has more experience has uh that pattern recognition of how people are and it's it's trying to communicate with you saying there's something not right here or this person mm -hmm. is not you know and consciously yeah. you don't have the information and i think there's some there's that's just an example of i feel like how we are trying to negotiate that relationship with um with all parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah i feel that yeah and i think like to that point um one really cool and sometimes scary thing about moving to the raw food level and, and fruit too is like i think that that side of you becomes like really open and more clearly communicating like you know everything that you just named you just felt felt knowledge you know inside you and it's interesting, like, I feel like um, it's really this resensitizing that happens with us. And I think some people can be scared by it almost, you know? Um, and I, I credit that phenomenon 
um, for, I think, my ability to make the ethical vegan connection, I think, um, because I s get scattered around it a lot for many years before, and it wasn't until fruit um, and actually getting those things out of my body that I was able to see it so clearly. Yeah, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of people think that the path that people get towards eating fruit and, and the raw vegan style lifestyle, a lot of people think that it's uh, a logical progression of I'm doing a standard diet, I then cut out this, I become vegetarian, I then go vegan, I then go plant-based, and, then, and it's, I find there's just as many people who almost go straight to eating fruit or trying to do juicing or something because sometimes health reasons, sometimes mm -hmm. other reasons. Um, it sounds a bit like yours was kind of a progression, but at the same time, you made quite a jump as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's funny. I was making vegan recipes. Like I look back at old, old posts from my Instagram and I was like hashtagging vegan and I wasn't vegan at all. I was probably hashtagging <laughs> vegan and paleo in the same <laughs> post, you know, like I, it's funny to me that I, I lacked that and I was an animal lover, you know, my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I even made that connection for a moment. But I think if you, if you don't cultivate that and, um, and there is something to be said about just the right place at the right time and your brain being uh, able to really feel it, you know, really feel it when you're still eating animal products and you're still stuffing down your emotions with alcohol and, you know, whatever other drugs. Um, I just, I just think you can't quite connect. And that's how I personally uh, think about it and what happened. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, not to get into unnecessary territory, but I, I do think sometimes that connection maybe never happens for people. And I think for the many reasons that people may leave raw veganism or veganism in general, I do think that there's just a nugget that um, is there that maybe wasn't fully solidified or maybe it was, but like, yeah. look at the social world of how quickly we can be pulled out of that if we're not surrounded by these ideals and convicted in these ideals, like just, just, like when I watch TV, which is pretty rare, we watch a lot of streaming stuff, you know, commercials, like terrifying brainwashing <laughs> and just, and just other people, the normalization of killing animals and the distance that we put between uh, that reality. And, you know, we make jokes about it to make it really easy uh, to get back into that territory. And I just yeah. think it's easy to slip into that if you're not convicted. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, this idea of eating fruit is funny because Anne Osborne sometimes shares newspaper clippings from a hundred years ago and throughout the century of, you know, stories of like this person is eating just fruit or there's a doctor saying we need to eat more fruit or just live mostly on fruit or, and, and mm. all this stuff. And it's not, if you look back in the day, it's not looked at like that's a crazy idea. It's almost like, wouldn't it be fantastic to like to live on? It's almost like it's not seen as a weird, like it's such a crazy thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. But I, I do think, and if, but if, if you see that now, it's definitely put across like this is crazy. And it might be that the media has changed and they, everything has to be crazyfied and like everything has mm -hmm. to be turned into a story. But for sure. I do think that there's a knowledge that's been lost about how people lived and how people ate and how people, and it's, it's happened mostly over this century. And, and like, there is a guy I saw, I go on TikTok sometimes and there's a guy saying, um, he, was, he, was, he was a nutritionist, right? And he was talking about uh, fruits, uh, you know, fruit was only, it was never been as available to us uh, now as it, uh, uh, sorry, Fruits were never available to people in the past as much as they are now. And we should only eat them in the very short, you know, summer season. And if, and the animals that eat fruit, they do it so that they can put on weight. And he was trying to make this case that like eating fruit is, helps 
makes people put on weight and <laughs> like and I was listening to this going how is this guy so miseducated like the idea that firstly um well I get but that's everyone right and a lot of people will listen to that and go yeah that makes sense you know <laughs> because they don't yeah. have any awareness of like it's only relatively recently that humans haven't lived in the tropics and a lot of people have never been to the tropics where fruit is just and big fruits are growing are like all over the place like weeds a lot mm-hmm. of the time and um and the, the 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 other thing is before obviously sugar and all that came into our diet i don't think people get how much fruit growing there was historically and how much orchards there were and mm-hmm. like how many people were farmers and things were were trying to produce fruits and new fruits and um and when he says things like we wouldn't have had access to fruit apart from in the summer months he's completely forgetting that people have been storing fruit in various ways right. for thousands of years like drying mm-hmm. fruits um yeah maybe turning them into alcohol which isn't the best thing but like <laughs> like essentially drying fruits and freezing them and that the apple season for example because of many generations of people working on apples and different like trying to get varieties to work in different places and all that there was an apple season that really went from about june till probably february you mm-hmm. know and mm-hmm. then you've got like so so the idea that there wasn't fruit available like yeah in a lot of places probably that is the case but um sure it's uh, yeah so i don't know <laughs> yeah but there's definitely oh. some kind of disconnect now with, with all this information huge huge that that's a really good point um never really thought about that um like that that piece playing into the distance but that, also uh, what's... sorry but it is one of sorry that's i guess that's what i was getting to it's that thing of like the people that are ex-vegan and all that who go like, like a lot of them get inspired by this you know mm-hmm. um almost like almost like a nationalism thing for white people is there's, there's, i've known some white people that are like uh oh yeah our ancestors wouldn't have done i'm like but you know you already know the information about our, our ancestors go back millions of years and we're in the tropics and stuff but some people get into that the whole like hunting and, mm-hmm. and all that and yeah, I don't know. I I I guess I understand. A lot of men, it's this kind of masculine thing as well, and I think eating fruit is like not maybe not as masculine or whatever as shooting as like hunting. But um, yeah, yeah, and they and there's all yeah. Well, there's always a connection with like libido and stuff as well, and and all that mm-hmm. stuff. It's all it's but yeah, I yeah um, yeah. It's, it's this this and and I. I've made these connections with some with certain people that mm-hmm. I've seen things they've went through in their life and I've seen events happen and then I see them change and like I know there's more to it but I don't you know I don't want to just confront them about it but but yeah there's always there's a lot more to this I think this ex-vegan thing I do too I do too you're you're touching on something that I haven't thought about but it's it's been made clear especially like with men is that masculinity thing and there's this like weird air of resentment that I feel like (laughs) like you it's there's a passing off of individual responsibility to some level and so you know I honestly think it's a it's a psychological thing of I'm choosing to go back to eating animals now it's easier for me to say this fucked me up than to admit, you know, maybe some other things that happened or um, some things that I potentially did that that weren't right and drove me to this point. Um, but there is a weird resentment tone with some of these men around like, I couldn't build muscle and I lost my sex drive. And it's like, well, I didn't see you doing push-ups. You were eating the fruit diet, <laughs> you know? Like, it's funny, I, all of a sudden these people who go carnivore, they're working out all the time but they weren't working out but it's such a weird disconnect because i've you know i've you know um i've hung out with some of these people and you know like whether it's at woodstock 
and Mike Vlasic is there lifting huge amounts of weight for you know, and or Doug Graham who's seventy years old and lift can lift a lot of weight, you know, and is a bit quite a muscly guy really. And mm-hmm. um, uh, and I know people that have met these people, but they still say that like, oh no, it's the fruit diet. They did this or that to me. So there's a real disconnect. It's it's mm-hmm. interesting, but. Uh, you then, I guess, what point did you start to share about this? Uh, maybe talk about your Instagram a little bit. And you've obviously had quite a lot of success um, with d- developing an audience who are interested in what you're doing. So how did that all take place? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I really, because I was sharing, I was in the habit of sharing already. Um, since I started it. So it was really kind of, you know, navigating the food element the whole time on my Instagram, but I wasn't showing myself and I wasn't really showing up for myself. I think in that time I lost a lot of self-confidence and also navigated the fact that like, um, I, I didn't ever really prioritize myself in a lot of ways in life. And so I think, um, I don't know, I, I just kind of became silent and muted writing and, you know, showing up in that way kind of became the default during chronic illness. I had so much to say and um, so much thought around it, but this was like the outlet. And so I think when I found fruit, I just documented that openly, um, just like I was doing with other things. But I, I definitely think there was a major tone change and I can't even remember the post that I wrote about it um was just very immediately convicted and um really tied into ethical veganism as well and um my partner had like been self teaching himself photography before all this and he was in design school and um yeah so we just, we kind of put ourselves together on that front in terms of photography. He was getting really good at it. We would always go out and shoot things like just for fun sometimes. Um, so we, he started, you know, shooting photography for the Instagram and I started to get a lot more passionate about fruit and sharing and just like a real strong drive to, to share the message and spread the message. Um, you know, to my dismay, a lot of people in the chronic illness community who I was like connected to in the earlier years weren't all super down with that. Um, but some, some were too, um, and some went that same path of plant-based fruit. Um, so yeah, it's really just been a natural progression of what has, it's a reflection of what has happened in terms of healing and and passion and feeling alive again, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and wanting to share it. Yeah, and, and people can follow you there at Rosie Heels mm-hmm. on Instagram. And do you do YouTube, anything else that people can follow? I have a YouTube. It's had a weird cooked food, plant-based cooked food recipe up for like years. And I'm like, I have a YouTube. I'm going to make YouTube soon. Um, so I am mm-hmm. actually planning on making videos at some point soon. Um, but yeah, the Instagram is kind of mostly where it's at. And I I have a website with, um, some deeper blogs and also have a course that I built around like the lessons of raw vegan healing, which is pretty in-depth too. Yeah. I actually watched some of that course. I've, I've, uh, that was that part of the, the bundle. bundle. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That was excellent. I, I, I was watching your course and I was like, this is really the phrase I would use. Like, it was quite intellectual. It was oh. quite. Uh, I don't say that in a bad way. I'm not. I don't mean that. Yeah. What I mean is that it was. Quite, <clears throat> it was quite detailed. Quite like, there's certain, there's certain people that would really like that. Like very in depth explanation. Um, and the way that you communicate as well on Instagram and all that is quite, there's quite a poetry to how you communicate as well. Like it's uh, almost a little bit cryptic at times as well. Like, so, um, sure, like, yeah. Yeah, but I think that 
people should definitely check out your your course as well. Is it a place they can find that? Yeah, um, it's right on the link tree on the Instagram, but it's actually just rosyheels.thinkific.com as well. And you can take a look at all the chapters and all that. And it's 30 bucks. Awesome. Awesome. But thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Where you, you were in the wood, you were speaking in the Woodstock online event. Are you going? Have you been? Are you speaking? What's the situation with that? I'm not speaking. I would love to go. Um, there are some logistical issues to where I may not be able to go this year, but I'm kind of hoping that by divine intervention, I'll be able to make the last minute decision to, to go because I really want to. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. I've got to go. Are you going? <laughs> I, 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 my intention is to go. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing would be... Um, I guess government's holding me back or whatever, or yeah, airlines, that's, that's I don't know. I'll try, I'll try. I, th I think I might have to go to somewhere like Mexico or something for a couple of weeks beforehand. Mm. But I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do whatever it takes. So I, I do mm -hmm. love it. I've, yeah. been there, I've been there the last eight times or something. So yeah, I can't speak highly enough of it. I try, I, yeah. I mean, I do this, um, one of my best friends, this guy, Jim, who I met at Woodstock, and we, he, he joins me sometimes for the, I do this Friday night, like Fruity Friday group, and it's just a hangout, basically, for people, mm -hmm. raw beans, and, and sometimes we talk about Woodstock, he always talks about Woodstock, right, <laughs> because he, he loves <laughs> Woodstock, but he's like, He's been into raw food since the 70s and all that. And he says, I've been everywhere. I've been to everything. I've been to all the centers. I've been to all the things. And like, this is the best thing. Woodstock is the best. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and, and we, so we go on about Woodstock to people because we love it. And then people will still be like, oh, but I heard that there's, you need to bring your own sleeping bag or something. And it's like, <laughs> geez, like, is that what's going to, is that what's going to hold you back? <laughs> we're trying to tell you it's, the, it's like the best thing ever and you're telling me like you're not going to go because of a sleeping bag or something or whatever <laughs> um yeah yeah great excellent well um what's yeah. what's going on with your with your um fruit fest this year well it is it is going ahead yeah and once again it could could it be prevented by the government maybe but i think it's less and less likely that that's going to happen now mm -hmm. uh, hopefully <laughs> and yeah but yeah it will be a little bit smaller than it has been in the last few years last year was smaller too but um and that's just been what's happening then uh but looking forward to it it's when is it about a month from now Fruit okay. Fest. So if people want to learn about it, fruitfest.co.uk, you can join the announcement list. Um, I not really promoted it enough in this podcast, so thank you. For, thanks for asking about it. But yeah. yeah, it's that's essentially if that goes ahead and goes well, then I go from there to trying to get to Woodstock. That's the plan. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I might go straight from there to Mexico or something. I'll I'll see try and get a plan together to get there um, it's sad because i know a few people that, are, that have been, a few people are pulling out from it or i knew some friends that were going to be working at it in the kitchen and stuff and they're like oh i don't think i'm going to go and all that and it's uh it's annoying but mm -hmm. um i uh i think a lot of people go to woodstock and love it and UK Fruit Fest as well. Like people love you. Like, but I I'm working at it more, so I don't get to experience it so much. But people love it. It's the best experience, have the greatest time, meet amazing people, all this stuff. Really great yeah. people, like super great people. And then over the and, and then you speak to them a year or two later and they're like, Yeah, I don't think I can make it. And they they totally forget the experience. Like they totally mm -hmm. forget how profound it was. And yeah. Um I always try and keep reminding myself of how good, good it is. Yeah. Is that, like honestly, Kelsey, like, there's been times where I I'm almost like, oh, I wonder why I'm going back to this thing again, you know. 
and <laughs> and I show up at the place and immediately I remember like immediately there's something so magical about it and it's a mm -hmm. special place for me but um there's such a vibe is all I can say <laughs> yeah I love totally that love it. I totally love it I feel yeah. that I feel that from the videos I mean that was that was another thing that actually really got me into this path was watching all the Woodstock videos and the synergy oh, and, of, of yeah that. I have so much like like yeah so I I was when I was getting into this starting to get into this came across some videos and all that I'd actually just been in New York with an ex-girlfriend and was just a vegetarian at the time and came back here and never thought I'd go to New York again like just kind of thought I did not really have a reason to go and then uh, started to come across the raw vegan stuff and then I started to see that all these people had been at an event in New York about that had happened while I was there mm -hmm. um, but I had no awareness of it at the time <laughs> and so that kind of caught my attention like that's interesting something happened in New York I was just in New York and then uh start to get into those videos and when I saw those videos at the festival like uh, I don't know if you've seen the ones from the first ever Woodstock but I was watching those and like that's amazing like this is like paradise on earth these people are like mm -hmm. it just showed it felt to me like this is the potential of what this diet is mm -hmm. that it can actually make people like happier and better and more open with each other and all this yeah. kind of stuff and I was just fascinated and I was just like, I, these are my people. Like, <laughs> I need to go and I need to go and hang out with these people. So, yeah, so I, but cool. it's so much. I have a lot of emotion connected with a lot of those videos. I bet. And um, there's like a song that's used in one of the first videos called "Home" by a band called Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. Mm -hmm. like quite a famous song. song. Yeah, yeah, quite a famous song. And that song would just bring it all back for me so so much like the emotions of all that mm -hmm. so yeah yeah I, I have a lot of feels yeah. for Woodstock <laughs> I bet yeah I have a, I have the feels I feel the feels but I haven't, I haven't experienced <laughs> it but yeah 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 no, it's, it. it's 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 um yeah I'm, I'm totally biased I love it you know so I I, I and I I uh, I always try and I think I'm a very pure like promoter of it because I, I don't make any money there. I, I don't get a free ticket. Mm -hmm. I don't speak at it and I don't get any advantage really from being there apart from enjoying yeah. it as an event. So it's cool. Um, yeah. So let me ask you about, I think you say you have quite a flexible approach and um, what would typical day be for you? Like how do you, for people that are maybe starting off doing this like how do you actually do this how do you do this lifestyle mm -hmm. um if you have days where you're more raw than others what does that look like what do other days look like do you want to give some sort of basic advice for people that are starting off yeah yeah i think the most important kind of rules to have um if if you're to that point where you're working fruit in and you're to the high level of fruit which I think, like we said, takes time and you want to definitely be plant-based first and um, find your footing with that. Um, I think starting out the day with a big fruit meal is really important. Um, I do that, you know, like 90% of the time in the last three years. There's sometimes where I start like with a celery juice or a green juice or something, but it's, it's much more rare. Um, and so having a big fruit breakfast and then potentially having another big fruit meal for lunch. And I think grounding and having a nice big salad for dinner, um, that's kind of like a good model, I think, to stick to. But it can look different for people. And you know, if you like to get more involved with um, special recipes and stuff like that, I think that's, that's also the time for the, the dinner meal, the grounding, satiating meal. Um, yeah, so lately I've been eating a lot of watermelon, um, a lot of berries. I've, I've been called to berries lately since it's been so hot here and it, it's getting to be like 106 or seven this week and we don't have wow. AC. Yeah. So I've been super called to the water rich foods and 
um, eating a lot of grapes. Um, yeah, but I also always will have greens or salad at night, but then I'll go through periods where I'm just having fruit days. Um, it's actually been a little while since I've done that, but in the last few days I've been doing uh, high fruit, higher fruit. Um, yeah, so I think like getting a lot of fruit in early in the day, I think food combining rules are important and real and you'll come to know that, you know? Um, but yeah, I think an 80, 10, 10 approach is really good. I'm the type of person who likes to have like a couple fruit days and then maybe like a mid level fat day. Um, I do feel best when I keep the fat low, but I just kind of enjoy Sure. that a little bit more like going for the full avocado <laughs> and for me I'm really I'm like four ten and three quarters and um like 95 pounds or so so like a whole avocado can be kind of higher fat sometimes sure. uh, depending sure. on what else I'm eating did you, but I'm not one to save an avocado half, did you, half did, an avocado. yeah did, did, you, did you ever have to count calories or anything did you ever like um have to work that out or were you eating have you always just instinctively done it how does that work for you it was definitely instinctive um but i realize now at first you know i was probably under eating because you just you just don't understand the full volume uh change that you have to go through and i think it takes some time for the stomach to adjust to that too um, so yeah, I will pop into chronometer sometimes and put things in. I think I'm usually like between 15 and 2000 calories and it's usually on the higher end, but it's really give or take. And it's really depending on what my body's telling me and, you know, potential like relative symptoms coming up and that kind of thing. I do, uh, value digestive rest and, you know, short, like cautious periods of digestive rest and, so I do sometimes work a lot of juicing into my day if I feel like that's helpful. Um, but I think most people will need to focus on eating more because that's just like the natural thing when you, when you move towards this diet. We come from the society of portion control and these high fat meals that um, you know are like small. <laughs> and it's a whole new thing. It's a whole new thing. I mean, I eat like when I eat in front of other people, um, it's like a show, you know, <laughs> like people who don't eat this way. Yeah. Like, oh my God, you're eating so much. How do you deal with that? You know, social things and all that. Did you, was that quite an adjustment for you? Were, were you always a bit different? Like how, how did that work out? It wasn't a huge adjustment because I sure. think I just had so much confidence around it. And um, the vegan thing too, like it just gives you some agency. I, I had agency around it and I had confidence around it. And I, you know, I wanted to tell everyone else about it too. And that kind of diminishes and changes over time. You realize like how to show up in that way with your message sure. <laughs> uh, because of how people react. But um, yeah. Was that I, surprising how, how sensitive people are about food? Very. <laughs> yeah, very surprising, still very surprising to me, yeah. but not so much when you break it down and look at why, you know, it's it's really one big defense mechanism and uh, on very different levels for different people, but it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah and I, I, can, I can see why, why that is. Um, yeah, but no, I, I can see why um, the social aspect can be hard for some people. And I do talk about that in the course a little bit, how there may be uh, potential things that you need to kind of do or reroute in your life to make um, that aspect easier or different. I don't think everyone just needs to get rid of their friends, but I think what a lot of people say is that organically, you kind of drift into new interests, new hobbies, new crowd and it can be hard to fit in with old people. So, you know, we still hang out with old friends and family, of course. And, and that can be draining just for the fact that you can't fully be your full self. Yeah. I, I, I've got to a point, I think where 
you know, people around me probably know I have a different diet and things like that. And and maybe they think I understand some things about nutrition, but maybe they don't. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But what I'm getting to a point of is when people sometimes people will start to talk about diet or they're starting to do something or like and and I do know a lot about these things, but I choose just to say nothing unless someone asks me directly a question. I just do yeah. I don't intervene anymore. I just you know I just stay out of. Uh, I don't try yeah. and jump into someone's <laughs> conversation and say, "Well, hey, you can do this or you can do that." Like mm-hmm. I um, I've I've just realized that that's you know that the, the you should only really do that for people that are specifically asking for your your help or guidance and all that Mm -hmm. you should never should on someone (laughs) (laughs) i heard that once stop shooting on me (laughs) of course i've heard that because i went through exactly what you're talking about yeah and i'm kind of in that space now too where i really won't engage unless someone is asking except with um people like my mom and dad who (laughs) i still I still exercise that kind of no filter talk. Sometimes I've really backed off, but um, yeah, in terms of health issues, it kind of becomes a boundary thing where you're like, either stop complaining about that health issue or listen to me (laughs) talk, you know? Um, Yeah. But I think people have to, people have to ask for help. People have to find it Mm. themselves. And you can kind of tell when someone is, genuinely interested or when someone's trying to like get to the point of trolling you from the beginning you know yeah yeah um absolutely um so well it's been fascinating speaking to you and learning all this stuff and i think you're gonna give a lot of hope for a lot of people hopefully that can listen to this and if, if anyone's listening or watching to this uh watching this and this might help someone please share it with them and uh, you know and and to our point not all not all the time will we personally be able to help someone but someone else's story or journey will will help them and mm-hmm. it's maybe more relevant to to them and and you've got a story that may be very relevant to certain people so sure. that's uh, excellent um Thank you. before we finish off then uh just remind us like so at Rosie Heels on Instagram, mm-hmm. YouTube, and where else? Uh, and also, do you offer any other help for people? Do you do any coaching or anything like that, or have any intention to do anything in the future? Do you, do you want to let us know what you're thinking of doing? Yeah, thanks. Um, RosieHeels.com is the website um, where there's some blogs that kind of dive into the histamine stuff more and chronic fatigue and and EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, I do have the course out, which I think is a pretty holistic look at things. Um, And I plan on doing more types of courses like that, Um, maybe smaller versions and something kind of condensed around the histamine MCAS thing, because a lot of people ask about it and I'd like to, yeah, do a little bit more on that front. But really, I do try to put, you know, pack it into the posts sometimes. And um, yeah, I, I plan to do more in terms of offerings, but it's still kind of being formulated. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you everyone for watching, for listening. Feel free to comment, message us by email, info at fruitfest.co.uk. Um, go to fruitfest.co.uk, join the newsletter to get more notifications about these interviews. You can follow these on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, other podcast places. Search for Love Fruit Podcast. Feel, please feel free to share this with others you think it might help. We really appreciate that. If you can give it a rating or something, that would be nice as well. And uh, feel free to stay in touch with us. Um, Kelsey, last words of wisdom before we finish. Yeah, uh, you know, go slow when you're kind of working your way into this lifestyle. And I think the biggest thing too is just having self-love and interrogating maybe where you're falling short on that front. Um, 
and things like meditation and mindfulness are huge, huge components of that too, which we didn't really touch on. But yeah, I think just um, being there for yourself, being forgiving and being fluid is really important as you take it on. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me, Kelsey. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you everyone for listening and watching. And we'll see you in another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast.